Thunder! 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 Oh! Oh! What are you looking at, nerd? Hey, welcome to Thunder Nerds. I am Brian Henson. And I'm Frederick Philip Von Weiss, and thank you for consuming the Thunder Nerds, a conversation with the people behind the technology that love that what they love do. Love what they do and do tech. Good. Good. Ha! Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us on our first episode of season six. Really appreciate it. Brian, go ahead and take us off. Yeah, I'd like to thank this season's sponsor again. Uh, coming back again is Auth0. Uh, they make unified logins for apps uh, easy uh, and uh, allow you to make a custom, secure, and standards based unified login by providing authentication and authorization as a service. You can find out more at auth0.com. And they have a lot of uh, uh, other outlets like youtube.com, auth0 auth for great developer resources. Their Twitch channel, uh, Twitch TV forward slash off zero for some great live streams. And uh, they also have Avocado Labs for an online destination for meetup events organized by their advocates at avocadolabs.dev. Thank Thanks, you again, Ryan. Off Zero. Yeah, thank you, Auth Zero. Really appreciate it. So, with uh, all the uh, adus being furthered now, let's go ahead and get to our amazing guest. We have designer, author, educator, the king of web standards, and a person apart from the rest, Jeffrey Zeldman. Welcome to the show, Jeffrey. Thanks, Frederick. Uh, thanks, Brian. It's awesome to be here. Thank you. Yeah, we really appreciate you being here. Uh, Jeffrey, why don't we first start off with something topical, which is uh, everything going on with, with the COVIDs. We're still experiencing mm -hmm. this. It's it's hard for a lot of people to even get a vaccine. And uh, for a lot of us, it's just not obtainable at the moment with age and, and, and whatnot or jobs. And certainly uh, it's probably going to the right people at the moment. But you, you've you received now the the, the two doses. I'd uh, yep. love to hear your experience and want to know how the knee's doing. <laughs> Thank you. Uh I got two doses because I'm old, and uh, I mean, there's a whole lot of frontline workers who haven't gotten it. Um, people with unglamorous jobs like janitors who haven't gotten it, uh, food delivery people, mail people, that's wrong. They yeah. should have gotten it first. I get it because, but I, I have the privilege that I, you know, I work at Automatic, uh, makers of WordPress and so forth uh, at WordPress.com. And uh, I have the privilege to work remotely. So I could have waited. I also have read, like, if, if you qualify, you should go get it. Um, you're not actually helping people if you decide. It's not up to you. You basically, when your lottery is called, you just go. So I went. Um, and I'm also glad to have had the second one. Had it just a few days ago. Doing OK. Um, the, so the experience is you in New York, the experience is there's 50 websites. Uh, they were designed mm -hmm. by whoever they could get. Um, they're not, it's not a UX experience, right? It's not like a, a very cultivated UX experience. It's under-resourced folks from very, you know, somebody knows, uh, HTML or JavaScript and, uh, they throw something together. It's like whack-a-mole in reverse. Um, basically, you're told this is the you know that you have it, and you you just click one link after another until you find a website that has an event that you can go to, and you sign up for it. And if it's you know what it's it's not going to be like they're doing it in a hospital on my block, but I can't go to that one. You know, it's like I I go to another borough, so I've been I've been to uh, another neighborhood, another borough. The first one they got, they, you know, it, it's it's uh, it was sad to see there were people who had trouble, difficulty walking, and so forth, and they hadn't really set up for them. It's still, you know, mm. it's a work in progress. Um, yeah, on the other got hand. And you got COVID too, right? Uh, I mean, I, I, you're, you yeah. blog, blogged about it too. <laughs> in late <laughs> February, in late February of last year, I came down with it. 
for three weeks, I denied that it was COVID. Like I was sure it was something else. I was already working remotely and I wasn't going out. So yeah, I quarantined without really thinking about it. But, but uh, then I saw the doctor and said, yeah, he said, yeah, that's it. Um, I had it for about four months. Um, I'm still in recovery. I still, I breathe like Darth Vader when I'm carrying groceries. I can't really, if I walk more than a block, I'm tired. Uh, so that's the first thing. And the second thing is there's some weird neurological stuff for me. Like this morning I was looking in, I was looking at five, bottles of medicine in a medicine chest, except there were only four, but I saw five. And then I went, but I know there's four, and then I saw four. So I'm not dyslexic. My daughter is, I'm sure my brother is, I'm sure my dad was, my daughter's mom is. It was overdetermined. I never had that. My problems with math were emotional. Like, you know, like I, I, I didn't want to, I didn't like math as a, I'm creative, I don't want to do math. No. That's for nerds. Uh, yeah. Well. Yeah. No, I didn't mind being math. a nerd. I didn't mind being a nerd at all. Oh, okay. Yeah. No. No. I just meant the little kid thing, you know, as a little kid. Yeah, yeah. That's Absolutely. for nerds. Absolutely. I, I, I. We could probably spend an hour on that, but any. But anyway, so <laughs> there's there's stuff. There's like some neurological damage. I don't really know the extent of it. I get. I have to take a nap every day. Then again, I'm old, so you know who, how much of this is would have happened anyway. I don't know. I wouldn't say you're you're that old, but I mean, yeah, uh, having a nap is very nice. But <laughs> but yeah, the it's the brain the fog, greatest. yeah, the brain fog for people is, is seems like a, a very real thing, and a lot of people are experiencing that. And um, uh, yeah, I, I couldn't imagine. What about the 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 post kind of um, uh, experience? Like, do you? Do you are you, do you have any kind of like a depression from it? Are you are you suffering anything from like oh this 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 brain fog is just bringing me down? It's 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 hard to concentrate, etc. No, I um, I'm really a survivor by personality, and I've overcome things in the past, and so I'm really grateful to be alive. I know people who died. I know people who are much more incapacitated. I really glass half full. I'm I'm I lo I'm lucky to have a job. I'm lucky I can you know do my conference as well, and I can do what I need to do. I can take care of my kid. I'm a I'm a homebody with an anxiety disorder, so. Being stuck at home doesn't bother me. And my kid's here, so, and, and her mom lives very close by. So uh, all that is good. I, I, I think there's, I hate to say there's silver linings because especially for people who've lost somebody, it sounds yeah. incredibly callous to go, hey, it hasn't been so bad. No, it's been terrible. It's, that's horrible. But, um, mm -hmm. but spending extra time with your family because the schools close during the day, not a bad thing. Yeah. I mean, we all have our own context, our own world and our, our own yeah. difficulties and you know, trials and tribulations. So I think that's understandable. And I love all your, I love all your titles for the world's shittiest vacation. <laughs> it's totally true. <laughs> did, I, did, I, did I say that? <laughs> yeah, for yeah. COVID-19. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I like that. It's that like, great. hey, we're having spaghetti again. <laughs> yeah. It's possible to have too much spaghetti. I thought it was uh, 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 pretty interesting too. I, I don't know, interesting maybe is the right word, but it, it, it sucked that you had that issue with your, your, I think your air condition went out, like ruined your floors while you're like deep in the sickness. Yeah. Yeah. So I lay there, I lay there with a flooded floor for a couple of months. Oh, and my God. kid isn't old enough. Like it, she couldn't really. But so, so then I had a guy come in. But it was a class. Did you ever watch uh, Mr. Blanding's Built His Dream House? Or you ever just listen to a comedian do a monologue about? I mean, once you get an expert in it, in oh, they know yeah. and you don't know, and uh -huh. <laughs> all these other problems. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. it's well, it's really what it is. Yeah. So it ended up being much more expensive, and 
I have really good insurance, but it's America. So like they said, that's great. You have, it's cost $7,000. That's terrific. You're fully covered. I'm like, oh, thank goodness. And they're like, we'll cover $2,000 of it because <laughs> 5,000 is deductible. And I'm like, that's yeah, right. what, yeah, you know, but you know, so, but now I have a floor. So that's nice. And I love that floor. And I've kind of swept everything that was in my room into a corner of the living room that I don't look at. And um, there's basically a, what used to be a dining room area is now just a storage unit. I don't go there. I don't look at it. It's depressing. Uh, but my room looks like a Japanese monastery. Ooh. There's like, there's a bed, there's a little statue, there's a bureau, a light, that's it. And, and, and it's great. I have a lot of peace in that room. Yeah. Um, I, I would, I, I wanted to make a point, which is I'm fortunate to work at a good company, but, um, I think there are people coming back with brain fog and other problems who are then getting not where I work, but at other companies who are then sort of getting pushed out of their position because they make mistakes. This is the third time you've made that mistake or do you know what I mean? You're yeah. not paying attention. You're not learning. We changed that process last week. I think managers, if they're listening, like managers need to be a little extra sensitive right now and supportive. I think many are, but, but if there's somebody who, and if there's somebody who feels like they're having issues, which are not their fault, which are purely neurological and because they had COVID, but they're getting punished like they're a scoff law or like they're just not doing their job. I think it's okay for them to um, request a little support. I, I think it's really important for companies to do that right now. Yeah, that's that's a really great point because, as you said, so many people are coming back and you know, having these these issues that it's it's not a fault or anyone's fault. Um, I, you know, that's a different discussion. But yeah, uh, we, we need to be a little bit more understanding and caring to help everyone uh, get adjusted and, and see where things go. I mean, it's we're still uh, probably a good year off from getting to uh, some kind of level of normal, uh, maybe sooner. I don't know. It's certainly not the fastest to get these vaccine vaccines out there for um for people, I mean, as you see right now, it's people are fighting. I read on on the news the other day that uh, there was two people in Florida that go Florida that dressed up like elderly people so they yeah. could sneak in and get vaccines. Oh God! <laughs> and it worked. Uh, it worked. And it worked. They got don't the vaccine. Don't have records? They, don't you have to show a birth certificate? I don't think they no, no, are. no. We're talking about Florida. Jeff. No. Oh, okay. No. Yeah, because yeah. in New York, you have to show like your age or that you have a, a job, like you have a job. Actually, in New York, they're really good with frontline workers, medical frontline workers. If you show that you're a medical frontline worker, you know, you, but you have, okay, so Florida, you just walk in and that's bizarre. Yeah, yeah in Florida, you walk know. in, you're, you, you know, you pass them a beer and it's like, cool, all right. I can okay. say that because I'm from Florida. It's it's oh, very okay. everything's okay. everything's yeah, very yeah. lenient. That's here. fair. That's fair. Same, okay. same here. Um, yeah, I'd like to transition a little bit into your your background, Jeffrey. But I want to read a quick quote uh, before we <laughs> sure. before we do that. Um, I would recommend this browser to any Mac user. In fact, I'd recommend it to anybody because I believe it is the most standards conformant browser released by any company so far on any computing platform. It's a win for designers and a win for people who use the web. And that is a first. And that, that was you, of course. And uh, IE5 was the browser, which just, uh, I say that just to highlight, you know, how how long you've been in the field, how much, how the contribution over the years. Um, not because IE5 is good anymore, but back then it was. IE5 Mac. That was IE5 Mac. IE5 Mac, yes, correct, yeah. So um, the, the lead <laughs> developer behind that, behind the Tasman rendering engine, Tantic Chelik became a friend of mine and he'd been involved in web standards for a long time. 
and he made the horrible mistake of supporting web standards before <laughs> his company had fully aligned around that objective. Yeah. Um, and that's not to fault Microsoft. They were ahead of the game versus Netscape, right? Oh, yeah. Um, at the time. But uh, it was the first time somebody had really tried to... I hit, there's a weird thing with the in the beginning of CSS. Nobody except possibly Eric Meyer mm -hmm. really knew how it should work because there was no. It was a chicken and egg problem. So right. So Hokum Lee and Bert Bowes created CSS, CSS one, and no browser supported it because it was in their minds and they said this is how it should work. But what did that mean? And so there were test suites and but you know that's it's a it, I mean, it, it's a process like a creative process, like um, making a movie and you start with a script and then there's storyboards. And then when you're actually building the models, you find out that the mountain doesn't really, it looked great in the storyboard, but when it's actually made of clay and it's put in the background of the shot, it doesn't work. <laughs> so you have to rethink that. And, and that's, you know, yeah. the, web, the web standards design saga was a lot like that. There were a lot of great ideas, but then a lot of things, you know, when you dream, you know who a character is, but, or, you know how dreams like leave blanks? Like, it's not always, oh, it's yeah. not filled. Like, that's why movie scenes of dreams never work because they shoot every pixel, obviously. So you can see every detail of the, the doctor's beard and his freckles and the wart on his nose. But in real, you know, in the real world, in your dream, maybe there's just, a medical gown floats by or who knows what some synapse is fired and you think so web, uh, web standards implementations were a lot like that css was a lot like that this is what we think it should do i had a book i don't remember the author now i feel really bad it was the first css book i got in 1996 and it was here's what we think it should do here's what we think will happen oh man i i apologize profoundly to this author but the other it was it was it was guesses. And then he was sort of in Photoshop faking screens, like, I think it ought to look like this. And I think this is what Float will do. Um, but mm. the other thing, even when IE5 Mac came out, for a long time, I was still doing layouts as tables. So basically, I would do symbol column their tables because how do you make columns in CSS? Wasn't it wasn't part of the original specification. In fact, it really wasn't part of the specification until CSS Grid, like, you know, a few years ago. So basically for a long time, we've been getting by on hacks. Oh yeah, definitely. We have floats, <laughs> clear fix. <laughs> yeah, it, it's weird yeah. because there's a hypocrisy. I don't know if hypocrisy is exactly the perfect word, but there's a contradiction, maybe a slight hypocrisy where like, no, you shouldn't do it that way. There's standards. Oh, so what's the standard for layout? <laughs> well, um, use floats. But, but aren't they supposed to be used? For, shut up. Use floats. <laughs> exactly. That's the standard. So Go ahead and use uh, uh, some images for your uh, rounded corners in your table. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those were... Oh, those were oh. I hated those days. <laughs> Doug Bowman. There was a whole generation of wonderful... Doug Bowman, Dan Cederholm, um, Dave Shea, just really, really talented people who came up with, uh, you know, Dave, Dave, Doug Bowman was like, you know, the rounded corners in, in before we had responsive design, but we had like mm. liquid design, like oh, yeah. flexible yeah. design. How could you make the rounded corner and then allow that tab to get what? Now it's, you don't even think about it, but then it was, it was, there were so many layers and you'd be like, oh, I'm yes, so glad I got hacked. rid of table table layouts. Now I just have 7,000 divs and spans and I'm using a italic to mean add this rounded corner. Like just, you know. It goes yeah. back to the hacks conversation. I, I right. Every once in a while too, I, I get this uh, this kind of PSD where, where I'm like, uh, can I actually do that? I'm like constantly on, can I use? And I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, that, that does exist. Okay, just checking. <laughs> So I, I love Can I Use? What a wonderful public service, but I also hate Can I Use. Um, oh, my, my 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 conference partner, Eric Meyer, a genius, also would have charts of like, 
here's you know here's how the 5.0 browsers support on various platforms support various or um peter paul koch is another like like brilliant person who would make these charts of what worked and didn't in various browsers and i was just like well the reason so the reason i loved it was you know without that we couldn't do our jobs and the reason i hated it was it's a standard it's just supposed to work i hated that we yeah. had you know and that that's yeah. very childish in a way because time takes time yeah and it's like the chicken but, and egg thing too because right. like if, if if you see oh it's not supported and no one's doing it then the browser's are like well no one's doing it we don't need to support it <laughs> that's another thing that's, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. it's so frustrating yeah. HTML5 has has things in it not because they're well considered best practices but because well this is what this is what 50 developers were doing that you know that hicks ian hicks and followed you say well they're all calling it content area so it's now going to be called oh. content area or whatever do you know what yeah. i mean um so it made sense pave the cow paths it made sense to go let's make standards the way people are really using this stuff but there was probably an intermediary step where it would have been nice to be asked and, and go, oh, well, if you're doing that, let's have a conversation. Problem is conversations <laughs> yeah. take seven years and that's the W3C and people were restless, which again is why. Be nice. Yeah, Todd yeah, Libby. It, it, oh, Hi, yeah, Tom. yeah. I just wanted to get, get Todd up on here. Yeah, it took a class in college. Uh, and school used Mac uh, G3s with IE5 back in 2003. Yeah, we we all been there. Oh, G3s. Are those the, G3s. Are those the G3s. towers or the? Yeah, they the were the TVs. tower. No, no, no. They they were the tower. I think okay. they went up to the towers were up to G4. Was it the you, colorful you, towers? If I remember correctly. Uh, I don't think the G3s were. I think they were just the gray towers. That it was that, before like, the you, iMac, right? Was it before? Yeah, it was the, before. No, 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 no. It was, it was, it was during the iMac. But the, the iMac, the original iMac was very underpowered. It was like right. a yeah. consumer model. So it was like, if you're doing video editing, you need the G3. Uh, but if you're a school, buy an iMac. That's or right. If you're yeah. a family, buy an iMac. Yeah, if you were a professional, you went for uh, th that G3. You were like, oh, yeah, you know, I'm I'm really doing some stuff. <laughs> <laughs> or if you were broke, you went for a... Um, Clone, which is what I did, and I was very mad at Steve Jobs when he came. See, back there's no more clones. They were colorful, egg shaped. I was, I was right. They were the colorful ones. <laughs> yeah, oh, you're right. Hand, you the handles, I think. Do you have a? Yeah, do you have a, screen, a screenshot. Oh, I'm, I'm just quoting Todd here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, speaking of though, I mean, we're talking about web standards. I mean, you were, you know, you're heavily involved in the web standards project, you know, to help start all that. I, I didn't know that you were briefly had, were a reporter. How did you, you like, what was your transition into, into oh. know, doing web development? Like what, what was your, there was another that? step in. So I, I failed at a <laughs> lot of jobs before I, um, <laughs> we all do. <laughs> right. And, and I think you're supposed to, um, I, I learned something from every failure, like failure is great. Um, but, uh, so, okay, so there was a, a paper called City Paper in Washington and Baltimore, and I was living in Washington, D.C., and I went in with something I'd written, and they said they weren't interested. And then <laughs> uh, the editor quit the paper, and he took all his loyal writers with him. So all the writers mm -hmm. left the paper, and so the new editor-in-chief, who the owners had hired, he was calling people and going, okay, can you still write for the paper? And they're like, no, I'm loyal to so-and-so. They weren't going to do it. So in desperation, he started going through their morgue of rejected stuff. He liked my thing, and he said, come in. He said, would you would you write for us? I said, yes, but I want a column, and blah, blah, blah. And I and I got, so I got this music column. I was, I was also a musician at the time, and there was a big, well, there was a really interesting um, early hip-hop scene. Uh, and there was a really interesting hardcore scene, both happening in D.C. And I thought nobody's really covering the, the, the hip hop scene was called Go Go. It was like a, a sort of a swing beat that was it was started with kids in alleys hitting hitting drums. Uh, and, and nobody was covering this stuff. So I said I would cover it. And I had this column, which I called Kilohertz. And that was so I leveraged the editor's desperation 
not that I was like a strike breaker or anything, but just like, this was my chance. I took my chance. And after I'd been doing that for about a year, Richard Harrington, the Washington Post, uh, contacted me and said, we'd like you to write for us. And I was like, oh my God, you guys published, you you know, you broke Watergate. Oh my heavens to God, this is an amazing opportunity. Sure, I'll do it. Um, so I was doing it, but I was getting $35 an article. And I would have, uh, you know, 20 minutes to write the article. And they made me cover like Three Dog Night and Bruce Springsteen and groups like the, like touring groups from the 60s. And, and I'm not putting those groups down. And I'm certainly not putting down Bruce Springsteen. But I kept saying, we have this local scene that I'd like to cover. Like Rolling Stone does this. Cream Magazine does this. There's already publications out there that cover. Yeah. From my point of view, there were already publications that covered mainstream, successful rock, and I wanted to cover this other thing. And, and from their point of view, our readers in Alexandria, Virginia, who live in the suburbs, uh, you know, and commute to work in, in D.C., they don't really care about some punk group in D.C. They want to hear about Bruce Springsteen. So that made sense. Anyway, they fired me. But before they fought, they fired me without explanation. But before they did, I had started freelancing at an ad agency just because I was not making a living at thirty-five dollars an article. And the ad age, one day, there was a new, there was a Washington Post article by me here, tiny one, and right next to it was an ad that I had worked on, and I was like, "This is a sign from God." Like this is a weird coincidence, <laughs> <That's funny. laughs> and the ad sucked. Don't like it was my early ad. I, I it was terrible, but I was getting a salary there, and so I went. I have to. So when they fired me, it was kind of like, well, that's easy. That decision's easy. So I, I was a journalist, and I and I then I became a, an ad person. And when I moved to New York, there was no internet yet, and I got into advertising. And I really uh, struggled there. I'm creative, but I think to really succeed at something, well, you need luck and privilege and opportunity. There's lots of stuff that happens, but you also need passion. And I enjoyed advertising like a critic. I enjoyed ads from the 60s, you know, from the golden age of advertising. I was fascinated by the stories. I enjoyed the work, but I wanted to go home at night. And it wasn't for people who wanted to go home at night. It was like work seven days a week. You know, if you're not willing to come in Saturday, don't bother showing up on Sunday. So, um, so, and I worked, I also, because I had started in DC, when I came to New York, they were like, yeah, you worked at a regional agency, so you're already on a bad career path. You can't mm. you can't work at a good agency. It was like the almost like the Soviet Union. You're gonna be a ballerina and you're gonna be a worker, and that's that. And so I wasn't a ballerina, I was a worker. Was basically I could work at some place that made money and did boring ads, and places would hire me almost as the loyal opposition. Like bad agencies would hire me and pay me a living salary, and I would do work that didn't get produced to scare their clients back into the mediocrity that they were selling. So they'd say, well, here's the Zeldman and his partner came up with this edgy idea. Oh, see, you don't really like that. Well, that's okay because Chuck over here and his team came up with this very safe ad about, you know, for the seafood lover in you or, you know, only from the mind of an I like, I, I did a, an ad from an Ulta, you don't write your life story in pencil for this um, point and shoot camera that used 35 millimeter technology, which was new then. Point and shoot, but with 35 millimeter. That was amazing. That's standard now, but it was amazing then. So I wrote like, don't don't write your life. You wouldn't write your life story in pencil. And what they bought was only from the Mormon Ulta Magic, from this other team that did like super safe stuff. I'm not saying I wrote the best ad in the world, but there was thought in the ad. So I was, I was frustrated there. And then one day I'm in an ad agency uh, with, and Warner Brothers is the client and they say, hey, can you make websites? Don Buckley was the VP. Yeah. And I we just lied and said we could. We'd never seen a website. I'd never seen a website. 
at that, I was like strictly from AOL at that point, right? That was like AOL has you know graphic design and the web looks terrible, but but we um, we were ignorant enough to do all the wrong things and have like full screen backgrounds and all kinds of stuff that a lot of the, we, we had a flash intro before there was flash. We had like an animated intro. Um, I worked with Alec Pollock and Steve McCarran, two really super talented art directors. And the three of us just locked ourselves in Steve's office for like three months, refused to work on anything else. And after that, as soon as that was out, um, I made a personal site. And one of the things I started doing was explaining how to do web stuff because I thought everybody's going to want to do this. Every artist, musician, writer, everyone on the planet, every political person, every person who who um, can't get their point of view out. I, I was in love with the democratizing idea of it. I still am, despite the dangers that we're discovering with all that. And uh, and I. I wrote a thing called Ask Dr. Web, which was this first early primitive how to do web stuff, web design stuff, which had terrible advice like table layouts and all the things we don't do now. But good for the time. It was it was okay for the time. And also yeah. the other thing I loved about the web, um, a week after we launched the site, the client's very happy. John Buckley, the the director, Joel Schumacher is very happy. It was for Batman Forever. He's like, oh, it's better than a movie. I'm like, no, it's not. But thank you. That's a great compliment. <laughs> Obviously, it's not better than a movie. But um, the text was wall to wall because there were no gutters. And then I discovered this website called uh, Web Wonk by David Siegel. Uh, where he said you could make gutters by turning on uh, like cell padding and tables and turning off the display of the borders of the. So I did it and I, I, I sweet talked a producer at Warner Brothers and said, can I just go back up there online? And I edited the files online in fetch. And, to, and I was like, but what a thrill to change something live that like half a million people were looking at. Also, yeah. there were one million web users, and we had half a million uh, unique visitors. So, like, I'll never be that successful again. It was the first project, and it was like half the web, half the web used it. It was the <laughs> for a week. It was the Facebook of its day. You know? Yeah, you 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 built a you built a better bat cave is what it, what I've uh, uh, got from that story. I, I love how everything like like they didn't they didn't even know that they could make a website you guys didn't know you could make a website and then you even when i think you were pitching against a, another company too and you, like in the middle middle of the meeting you stood up because they were like yeah batman's gonna come out and he's gonna say blah 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 and you're like batman doesn't talk yeah that, that's right I, I was like yeah batman doesn't talk they like just <laughs> blurted it out which is totally rude i never should have done that but but you know, and if they if they could have totally won it, they could have said, we're going to use a Perl script and we're going, like, they could have, like, so surpassed us on technology and experience. They could have talked about early interactive strategies of 1995 and, and kicked our butts. But, um, but as in this, in this pitch, in this fight between the two rival potential builders, they said Batman swings out on a vine and says, "Hi, I'm Batman." And I went, "Batman doesn't talk." Like, I just like, like, how could you pimp Batman like that? How could you misjudge the character? It's just insane. he doesn't even talk in the movie. He's like, Trumpy word. like he's you know, he's yeah. like five angry words, like the kind of Batman that we had there. And so, um, and the client, Don Buckley, just like looked and was like, "Oh, it's done." One of the greatest things I learned as a designer is like what you there's a moment there's a moment in almost every meeting where if you say the right thing, everything else follows. You can really not always, but sometimes you can get alignment, you can get buy-in, you can sell work by, by listening and hearing that one really important thing that you just have to comment on. Again, it's that passion thing. 
right? A lot of times designers go, oh, why do I have to sit in this meeting? It's so boring. Or I hate to present my work or I hate to, you know, oh my God. Yeah. Look at that. That's um, <laughs> nice. that's the website. I love that's, it. That's the website. Um, we and I, a, I love, I love the navigation at the bottom. Yeah. That was, you know, that, and that was inspired by uh, CD-ROMs. It was inspired by America Online. Cute navigation was a really, people hadn't done it on the web, but so we did it on the web because, um, well, one of us was a gamer and was really into CD-ROMs uh, uh, and just digital design generally. So it was bringing a lot of stuff that, uh, some thinking from digital design into the web for the first time. And, and to do that, that's all a um, an image map, right? Where it's a giant image and it's clickable. And this relies on everyone having the same size monitor, right? Or everyone having the same 640 by 480 <laughs> dimensions, regardless of their pixel size, you know? If you had a bigger monitor, the pixels were just bigger. But um, yeah, and... It's kind of obvious, right? The, the text files are in the library, the downloadable videos that were 300 by 200 pixels that took an hour or two to download, like a few seconds um, at the time with 14.4 modems and 28.8 modems. But uh, I mean, it was magical. And I, I think just also I took, um, I took a Nicole Kidman photo that was like three megs in Photoshop, which before Photoshop had layers, just because of, you know, it was a very high quality photo and I reduced it to like a, a 4K GIF. Wow. And, you know, and, and just the idea that you could take something so resource intensive and make it so light and transportable. Obviously the 4K GIF didn't look anywhere near as good as the four megabyte Photoshop file or the, you know, half meg JPEG. But it was but accessible. It was, it was, well, it was, yeah, it was accessible in, in the broader sense. It was accessible. In the broader sense. Yeah. And, and, and in the time too. I really enjoyed too the whole um, uh, 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 part of the story where it's, you, you know, everybody said, uh, yeah, of course we could do it. Yeah, of course we could do it. You know, it's kind of the, um, the, the, the like the fake it till you make it kind of thing where yeah. it's like you know just but it, it's not about faking it I, I really don't like that term it's more about just kind of accepting that you could be um you you could take something on and try it and be you know just let yourself be vulnerable be the worst at something and accept that and because th that's where all learning starts right a blank slate and just accepting you you know you might be the worst at it but you could say yeah i could do it and you learned how to do it and you put out this great project and look where it led. So, you know, I, I think accepting things and, and, and saying, you know, let me try this and who knows where that could lead, obviously with, with your story that, that led somewhere great. Frederick, almost everyone I know from who started when I did or mm -hmm. who started within five years of that, everybody faked it till they could, they made it because we were, nobody knew anything. Yep. True. Exactly. Story. Nobody knew anything. It was um, the web wild uh, west. There was nothing. Also, I, I mean, where I work now, uh, automatically, we, we, we have a creed. Sounds weird, but we have a creed of like beliefs that we basically subscribe to uh, when we're thinking of working there. And, and it's no problem is insurmountable given enough time and effort. No problem is insurmountable. And I will always keep learning. And I think those two things are yeah. at the start and, of my career. And they're still like, that's, how I live every day. Like, like I don't, I think we can do it was advertising speak for, we are confident that with our abilities and with the available information, we can learn what we need to learn to make something great for you. Yeah. It's, it, you could be endlessly resourceful. If you, if you look in yourself and you're determined, you could, you could do it. You could do anything. And I know so many people who've overcome all kinds of, disabilities overcome coming from poverty and it doesn't mean that everyone gets to or that someone who who can't overcome an obstacle is deficient I'm not saying that but i'm but i'm saying that yeah. um 
I'm inspired by people who overcome things, overcome obstacles. And I think that's part of the life journey we all have one way or another, right? Yeah, absolutely. It, it makes me uh, kind of transition into your your career journey a little bit. I think we could touch on it because in, in my research, it seemed that th your 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 whole journey is a combination of a few factors, right? It's it's the chance you you kind of were in the right place at the right time with with uh, the way the web was. Um, you took responsibility, you took ownership for the way things were, and try to uh, help everybody out. Um, you know, you, you were you were relatable. You were the you know somebody just trying to do it just like everybody else in a blue beanie. Um, you know, you you were there. So I I believe that you know there, there's many lessons here. It's it's about keeping your eyes open. It's about um, it, being able to um, uh, look around and try to find opportunities. Um, so I, I wanted to ask you, um, to, what was what what's some of the current opportunities now that that you might see in uh, in the industry that that kind of go back uh, aligned with what where you came from and how how you started? Like, is it um, like voice technology? Is it is it something else? Oh, I think. Okay, man, my brain, I, I, I'm thinking faster than I can speak. Um, it's a wonderful question. I think there's a real opportunity in our industry to make user experience, not user exploitation. So that's Ooh. first. I think there's an opportunity to look at a lot of, we've gotten really good at some wonderful patterns removing friction, making it easier for people to shop, making it easier for people to get information. We've also come up with a lot of uh, addictive, destructive uh, patterns, right? We know how to make it almost impossible for someone to stop paying a monthly fee because it's so hard or make it almost impossible for them to return the product, even though by the letter of the law, we say you can return the product for a refund. They're we know how to make that so difficult that people, many people give up and just end up throwing this thing away and, and throwing their money away. Um, the anti-patterns. Anti-patterns. We know, yeah, there's a lot of anti-patterns. We know them. There's a lot of uh, dopamine-driven experiences, which I'm as addicted to as anyone else. Uh, but we have the chance to do better as an industry. So that's one thing. Um, also, accessibility is something that it's super important. It's still observed mainly in the breach. It's something people talk about and companies now give lip service to, but it's kind of like, like diversity and everything else. It's the company wants to do a better job. They know they should do a better job. They talk about it. They have pamphlets. They'll say, hey, this is the law and we believe in it, but they're still screwing up. So there's an opportunity um, to make more accessible experiences. And when you bring up voice control and stuff like that, all of that works together because mm -hmm. as you're designing an experience that's, that, that's voice amenable, that can be controlled by the voice or by the movements of a head, things that you do for accessibility now may end up being something that works for a non-disabled driver who, who makes something happen by moving their head later. Um, things that you do with voice commands to help a, a person who's um, physically, whose who's hands are disabled uh, may end up making an experience that a gamer or a television viewer can, can use in their home, making something like Alexa. So it all overlaps the multi-device universe, the need for, uh, Cont for have basic content structures that are still that are accessible and and structured in a way that content's still findable. All that stuff's really important. There's kind of a war, but not the one you're thinking of. There's a war between we can make stuff that's so awesome by grabbing the power of these platforms, these complex platforms, and we can make stuff that's awesome by starting simple and building an accessible experience first and then layering in. So, so um, progressive enhancement, the idea that you layer on top of a basic uh, 
accessible experience that you layer um, levels of additional uh, experience, maybe visual, maybe some some uh, you know maybe um, touch, but it works without touch or it works without a mouse. Like there's that, but there's also a lot of stuff getting built right now where people feel like it's got to be like an app and it's got to be the kind of app that works for 80% of our users and it's got to be, you know, it's got to be, there's always been a war between um, a conflict, a tension, an interesting tension, not a war, an interesting tension between pushing the envelope on exploration and discovery and making something new and cool like we did when we made Batman Forever, but if I go back, that was a completely inaccessible site and you had to have Netscape 1.1 to see it. But but it pushed boundaries. And going back to, excuse me, to the tried and true things that something should work for everyone, regardless of their device, regardless of the size of the screen, regardless of their abilities, um, regardless of their cognitive abilities, um, so I think there's a real opportunity there. I think web design and development product design is really hard and complicated right now. I the the days when you could open fetch and drag a few files to a <laughs> server, which I missed, those days are gone because our stuff is more complicated and more capable. But but we're trading off alert we're trading it off for a high learning curve i don't know how you start now and i worry mm -hmm. too that like a boot camp that prepares you like you come in you know nothing and they're going to train you with everything you know they're going to go like now you know how to use react and you know how to use bootstrap and you need to know how to use these five other things but you don't have the basics so it's yeah. almost like giving people 12 fonts and illustrator but not teaching them a graphic design so i, yeah. I feel there's an opportunity for educators. If you're a generalist and you feel, if you're a generalist, you may think, oh, I can't, I, you know, I don't know React, I don't know this, that, the other. No one will hire me as an engineer, but maybe they'll hire you as a pro product uh, owner, as a product designer, as a product developer. Being a generalist is still an important thing in companies, um, in agencies, so being a specialist is a great way to go and being a generalist is a great way to go. It depends on whether you're happier figuring out the experience and brand of a product or whether you're happier fine tuning the details, right? Of a particular aspect, a particular niche of it. Yeah, I've definitely seen that with uh, Bootcamp. Uh, people I've interviewed, cause I'm a, a manager at my organization and a lot of people who go through the boot camps, I, I, I like to compare it to this, like, it's like getting a microwave dinner um, and you can put it in the microwave and you make it and you have your food as opposed to um, chopping up the ingredients and, you know, knowing salt and pepper and, you know, the spices, what do you put in? Um, you know, the boot camps, I think they're amazing. Uh, I wish back when in my day there were things like that, but they do, I, I, they, I caution anyone going into them, you know, learn the basics too. I'm like, you know, take what they're teaching you and go above and beyond that. Yeah, and you need both now. I, yeah, I think you, you mentioned the same kind of thing the other day on uh, when you were talking. I think you were had a uh, interview with Dan uh, the other day where you're talking about how For me. it was easy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, yeah, Jeffrey. When when you were uh, talking about like Rachel Andrews, like when she first got into CSS and how back in the day it was a lot easier to get into something like such as that, like CSS, and now it's you know where do you start? Right. Yeah. There's um, during a pandemic and with child care going back to home and um there's a wonderful opportunity for parents maybe who are looking to transition to new work to learn and and work remotely on the web but the web is so complicated that if you're just starting i don't know how you do that and i i do quote my friend rachel andrew who was a, a young mom um and became a web designer and it was possible to do that back then with you know with your baby in one arm and and your fingers on and the other hand on the keyboard um and i think that's that's harder now i i hate the idea that we're losing that i hate the idea i i loved view source 
Like when I was teaching people how to do stuff, I was telling them what I'd observed in view source as much as anything else. You know, I looked at, so how did so-and-so do this? How did they get those two things to align or, uh, wow, that's so interesting. It was like the inspector. Now you would like pop open the inspector, but, but now, even with yeah. the inspector, everything's so complicated and, and we've replaced like millions of table cells with millions of divs and, and yeah, yeah don't I? Yeah. So and class names that are like <laughs> hashes that are like, what does yeah. this even do? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I, I didn't want to say one other thing with accessibility. I kind of feel yes. like to me, it compares because I I've been you know doing my best to learn it and I'm gonna get certified and everything myself, but it oh, wow. uh, it it kind of seems from my research and trying to learn things the beginning days of the web and some weird ways where it's not documented well the guidelines are kind of loose uh, all the screen readers and the brow browsers support some of this some of that um, so it's really um, I encourage anyone who has even a glimmer of interest in doing web development, learn accessibility, uh, you know, along with everything else. Yeah, so it's important. not automated. I mean, there are automated yeah. tools and all that. There's Very some, limited. Some, the, yeah. first, the first uh, WCAG, WCAG, uh, yeah. uh, accessibility standards were a bit loose and open to interpretation. Yeah. Um, and people complained. So they made the second set of guidelines that are much more, you know, the candle power of, you know, how many lumens of contrast is, is, mm -hmm. is sufficient and all that stuff. And, you know, that's not perfect either because it's possible to comply with every one of those requirements that make something inaccessible. It's possible yep. to have, right. It's possible to have, all text and all these things that are inaccessible for some and yet still be inaccessible. So it still requires judgment, like anything interesting, right? You can't, you can't automate being a doctor. You can't automate being an attorney, right? Uh, I think web and product design and development are, things that require i'm not talking about the complexity of the platforms and all that other stuff i'm talking about doing it well doing anything well whether it's playing basketball playing the violin or designing web experiences whatever it is it requires human judgment taste thoughtfulness experimentation willing to learn uh, willingness to learn willingness to fail um working with people, not designing for people, but designing with people. Um, so yeah, I think, I think there's a lot of opportunity there. Yeah. Cause the, uh, the web is for everybody. The web is for everybody. That, that's yeah. the nature of it. J Jeffrey, we're getting really close to the end. I just, I, I would feel bad if we didn't talk about the uh, event apart event coming up uh, very summer. soon. Yeah. Yeah. In April. yeah three days do, do in April. Sure. Yeah, do you mind if we just touch on that really quick, if, if, sure. if you want to talk about it? Sure, absolutely. So um, we, uh, Eric Meyer and I, with our staff, uh, you know, Toby Molina, Marcy Eversoll, um, and we, uh, we made this conference, uh, and we used to do six shows a year um, in various cities with 12 speakers, and they would be the best speakers we could find. Um, if you could put it, if you could put that screen up again and scroll down a bit and, and then since COVID, um, is it possible to, oh, no, you can't. Oh, I'm sorry. Right. It's, 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 yeah, a, it's, yeah, it's a piece of artwork. Okay. Yeah. I appreciate the artwork. That's awesome. It's anavanapart.com, but we have, uh, 16 speakers over three days. They're like the best speakers we can find. We curate the heck out of the experience because we're experienced designers. So the day starts maybe, you know, with it's musical. It's like listening to a good playlist or like watching a story there. You know, it starts maybe with a really good general topic and then moves into a stream of learning something. We, we serve developers as well as designers. It's a front end UX conference. So it's not, there are interaction design conferences that are very good. There are UX conferences. that are very good. There are front end code conferences that are very good, but this is a holistic conference it's for it's everything and 
you know, Eric and I, before we started this conference, we'd both done hundreds of speaking gigs, like literally. Uh, and I used to watch other conferences and, and, and learn from them. Um, what makes a good conference? And, and one thing we both agreed, we used to meet at South by Southwest every year um, and have brunch, which was fantastic. And that, I, I was just getting to know Eric. And we always said, we love South by Southwest for all the content it's putting on. But man, today I have to choose between four things I want to see that are all on at the same time. And then when I talk, and, and I can only see one of them, um, wouldn't it be great to have a purely linear conference where everyone sits in the same room for the same and everybody sees the same thing? No breakouts, nothing. So that everyone's taught, there's a typography session, everybody, everybody sees it. There's a responsive design. Well, we didn't know about that then, but but you know what I mean? Whatever it is, yeah. everybody shares it together. That was our idea. Now that, you know, it's now kind of, it's become a standard in its way. There are other one track conferences and that's cool. Um, but it's a one-track holistic conference curated musically with the best speakers we can find with things um best practices things that are coming down the pike things that are a bit experimental but won't be soon i mean rachel andrew was teaching css grid at our show four years ago and jen simmons was doing advanced layout and, and uh ethan marcotte debuted responsive web design on our stage. Um, Christina Halverson was on our stage talking about content strategy 12 years ago. So a lot of things that become standards, become it's a good place to learn what's coming. And yeah, what, sure yeah what I love about it is the diversity too. Uh, and I'm a big I'm a big believer too of one track. I like I hate, <laughs> I hate using the word hate, I shouldn't use it, but I don't it's like uh, multi-track conferences because it's always like that one that i want to see over here and then one over here i want to see and i'm like ah which one do i go to uh, but <laughs> and then and then yeah. when you share with your with other people afterwards you go did did you see what alice so-and-so said and they're like no like, did you see what no. brian says so -so? you're <laughs> yeah. like no yeah, exactly so this way everybody <laughs> you get to network with people who've all had the same experience and I think you're also, and correct me if I'm wrong, Jeffrey. They're, you're they're providing a promotion, like you you get a, a copy of uh, the the new the new book um, when you buy a ticket. Which book is if it? If you if you buy, yeah, it's Dan Cedar Holmes. Yeah, Dan Cedar Holmes, fine new book. Uh, Twenty bits I learned about design, the business, business, and community. Cool. Uh, Dan is a wonderful writer. It's just an amazing personality, really talented. Even did illustrations for this one. But it's, so it's it's the you get a free copy of the digital. We don't we don't mail you this. We you get the free copy of the digital if you buy a ticket uh, this month to to uh, the the three day show. Excellent. Yeah. Awesome. And it's it's uh, so live. You get donuts. Live, there's snacks and meals, hot meals all day long, and all this stuff that we can't do. But digitally, but what we can do, you're watching someone give a presentation, and you're also communicating with them uh, on uh, in a conversation channel. So, oh, Todd Libby says AE events, AE <laughs> events are a great time live or virtual. Thank yep. you, Todd Libby. Todd Libby has been to many of these. So thank <laughs> yes. you very much. So thank you very much, and and y'all have been. Uh, we did a, a booth with you with you folks uh, a few years yeah. ago. Yeah, so I hope we can do that again soon because that's a lot. yeah. That was yeah, that I was so it. much fun. I I really wanted to come up and say hi to you, but I think me and you both suffer from the same uh, uh, resting beanie mug. Uh, so I was like, oh, I don't know if I should say hi. I was a little intimidated. I love <laughs> meeting people, but then I get I get like now I have to go lie down in my room. I I yeah, I'll really. Me too. I, okay. And so, yeah, so the, the, the silver lining of the pandemic is I don't have to go out as much. And th everyone else is going like, man, I miss, I miss, and I, I miss restaurants. I miss looking at my favorite scenery and everything. But, uh, but there's something nice about like rolling out of bed, rolling over to the computer, rolling back to bed. Like my weird little hermit brain kind of digs that. So. Yeah. So, yeah, but it'll be great when we can do the live shows again for sure. But I, we're I, trying. I, yeah. 
we're trying to make the digital experience as close to it as we can and and having some success i think yeah i definitely miss the uh live conferences and, and the like but what i don't want to miss Right before the end of the show, we like to, to have a little segment we call lightning questions where we okay. each ask you a quick question. Um, and oh, there's the lightning. <laughs> and so I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll kick it off. Um, so if, uh, if you were in the circus, would you rather be the person with their head in the lion's mouth or that gets shot out of a cannon? I don't want to be in the circus. It's cruel to animals. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good answer. It's a good answer. Go ahead, Fred. Jeff, Jeffrey, what song stuck in your head right now? Uh, Bend Down the Branches by Tom Waits. Because it's oh, just a oh, ridiculously a heartbreaking song. That's a good um, one. So good. What what chore do you absolutely hate doing? Like you're like, you don't want to do that one. Picking up Kleenexes from the floor. <laughs> How they got there, I won't say. <laughs> <laughs> Jeffrey, Blood Money is my favorite album. Which one's your favorite Tom Waits album? Right now, for Tom Waits, I would say um, um, Orphans, Brawlers, and ba uh, uh, Brawlers, yeah, the Brawlers and Bastards. Yeah, it's just. And then. Um, so good. Also, a really old album that he did um, called Foreign Affairs. Um, oh, the especially 70s. Especially Side One. Yeah, the 70s. With completely different sound. Uh, and he Completely, has a duet yeah. with with Bet Midler, but he's like, girl, since you left town, just like he's like a this weird hundred and fifty year old <laughs> drunk singing to a cigar, <laughs> singing like to a cheap cigar, and like yeah. coming out of a. It's just I don't know. It's beautiful. It's, it's, it's beautiful. beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like yeah. so. So where do you mind not waiting? So you're waiting somewhere, and you're like, you're I'm okay waiting here. Um, I didn't mind waiting for my shot. Oh, that is a vaccination. That's a very good it's one. Like, yeah. I was like, you know what? Happy to be here. It's okay. Um, also, this is weird. When I travel, I don't mind sitting in the car. In fact, I start to get like addicted to being like if I'm in a uh, if I'm in a lift or a taxi on my way to the airport. At a certain point, I just wish that the taxi ride would go on forever. I don't know why. It's bizarre. Oh. And when on a you just need a limo. On a flight, um, I get off again, like I'm taking uh, some kind of transportation to the hotel, and I start to wish I didn't have to go to the hotel. I start to wish I could just stay on the train forever. I don't mind you know, three, four hour train rides. I like them. So I don't know. It's weird. Um, I hate sitting in an airport. And uh, yeah. And I hate taking a really long time to cook. Uh, I'm really good at recipes that I can make in about five minutes and bad at anything else. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> uh, Jeffrey, uh, let me ask you, I know you were in a band called the Insect Surfers, and correct yes. me if I'm wrong, but what instrument are you playing? Do you still play now, and uh, do you have any kind of musical aspirations that, that, that you I have, continue with? I still play keyboards. I've played them since I was eight. Um, I should be a lot better, but I... I don't really play much anymore. I, I was more of a composer. Um, mm. Had I, I gave up on music uh, when I was 29. I was just like, okay, I, I can't make a living with this. I think like, like most people, um, the amount of drive that you need. Uh, and also yeah. you should feel like you have no other options. If you have another talent, it's so much easier to get paid for any other talent, regardless. If you're a mediocre accountant, and a pretty uh, yeah, damn yeah, good yeah. keyword player, you're better off as an accountant. Like, like more there's money. more work for you. And I'm, I'm not putting accountants down. I'm just saying, if you're an okay, if you're an okay designer, and design is creative, and I love design, but if you're an okay designer, there's more work for you than if you're a really good musician, but not great. Like you have to be so great. And but you then, might have more fun as a musician. And Maybe. then, and then you have to have a, <laughs> something very unique. And the person that like you have to be Prince or or Bowie or or um, Tom yeah, Waits. Not, uh, Tom Waits. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not even going to go on. And uh, <laughs> yeah, go ahead. So what? My my last question for you. Uh, what fact amazes you when you think about it? The, we're all made of stars. That's a good one. Yeah. 
My my last uh, fast question, lightning question here is uh, Jeffrey. What are are those novels that you wrote? Are they out there somewhere? Oh, they, yeah. uh, I wrote and, three books in my twenties. Oh. Uh, I finished um, two of them. They were terrible. I lived in a complete fantasy world. Um, my daughter is brilliant, and she says she's weird, and I say, no, you're creative. But honestly, I was weird. Uh, I am creative, but I'm <laughs> we're also all weird. weird. I, I, yeah, I have to accept like we're all weird, and that's that's fine. You know, I don't think Tim Burton was popular as a child, and that's okay. Like, not not saying we're as good as he is, just saying in our own special way, we're also awesome. I think everyone, you know, so, so yeah, that was a weird answer. Was it, was that a complete answer? I'm not sure. That was that, a complete that, answer. Brain By the way, fog. That, I plead brain, that, brain fog. That brings me to that uh, Netflix uh, show that's coming out with Tim Burton. He's doing a, a Wednesday Adam show on Netflix live oh, action. Really? Oh my. Oh, that's Just weird. got announced yesterday. Yeah, I know. So it's going to be weird. I, but but no matter how good it is, um, it's always going to be Christina Ricci for me. You know, Christina oh, Ricci yeah. is Wednesday Adams. Like, I don't know how you could top that. Yeah. Then yeah, again, it's pretty impossible. Then again, I liked the show Hannibal, and I think Mads Madsen, what's his name, Mads. I think yeah, he, he was. Ama he made me forget while I was watching that show. He made me forget um, the brilliant British actor. Yeah, he's amazing. Brian, do you got any more? Uh, no, no, that's it. I mean, uh, all I want to say is, you know, time is more valuable than anything else. And I really appreciate that, you know, you shared some of yours with us this morning. So thank you for Likewise, us. you yeah. all have a, you have a great show. You're wonderful interviewers, really nice people. I'm wishing thank you all you. the best. And uh, let's thank do you, this Jeffrey. again sometime. Uh, and, and Je Jeffrey, Je the last thing we like to ask people is uh, if, if you have any kind of parting advice for the audience. Uh, I, I I would say uh, no problem is insurmountable, and I would take it right from uh, you know trust yourself. Uh, we all have um, we all have imposter syndrome. Everyone has imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. Everyone feels like they're faking it. Um, we're all faking it. It's like parenting or anything else. You, <laughs> you figure it out on the job. There's no manual, and no matter how much training you have. There's still, there's unique stuff that you're going to contribute that no one else can. So believe in yourself. If people, if you're looking for a job and people don't get you and you're not getting hired, that's on them. Because there is something that's perfect for you. That's something that only you can do and nobody can do as well as you. And find it or make it, but believe in yourself and don't be discouraged. That's what I would say. Well said. Sounds great. Thank you so much, Jeffrey. Again, Pleasure. thanks for being on the show. I I forgot I was going to have my blue hat on for the oh. uh, for for the for the questions, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I I thought I'd sport my blue beanie. Yes, I'm 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 making a fake one here. I'm doing the gray one. Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> it's a bore. But yeah, <laughs> Jeffrey Zelman, thank you so much for being on the show. Really appreciate it, and thanks everybody for watching. Yeah. Uh, catch you next time. Thanks all. See you next time, everyone. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Jeffrey.